Hi guys, and welcome back to the Divine Witch Podcast. I'm your host, Debbie. And today we have a very special guest joining us, Astraea Taylor, one of the most known pagan authors here in Ohio, talking about her new book, Modern Witchcraft with the Greek Gods. During this video, we're gonna deep dive into some of her previous books, along with her personal journey. Please keep in mind to watch the video so that way you can learn how to enter a chance to win this book from us or for a chance to win with Australia. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in to Modern Witchcraft with the Greek Gods. Hi, Australia. Thank you for joining me. I really do appreciate this. And as you guys seen from the introduction today, we are going to be talking about the new book, Modern Witchcraft with the Greek Gods, which she has beautifully displayed in her background. For anybody who's never read any of your books or may not follow you or Jason Mankey, can you kind of tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So yeah, my name's Estrella Taylor. I'm an eclectic pagan witch. I've been part of the community since like 98 or so and um just bouncing around festivals and gatherings and whatnot for a long time learning things <laughs> uh and you know um I, I wrote this book called intuitive witchcraft because i encountered a lot of people who um were wondering like how i could come up with a system of uh, a magical practice that really worked for me even though i was never part of any real traditions like i've taken part in all kinds of rituals from druids um rituals to uh, a lot of wiccan rituals with circle sanctuary and psg you know their festival pagan spirit gathering and all other kinds of traditions so uh, but I never had been initiated, never went to the classes or anything like that. So um, some people uh, <laughs> were thinking that it was just wrong to be outside of a tradition and bad. And so I really w wrote the book Intuitive Witchcraft to help um, let them know that, yeah, my my practice looks like a lot of other people's practices. You know, we just do what feels right when it feels right for us. You know, we may not have all the ingredients of a spell but, um, you know, we open our spice cupboards and we see what we do have, you know, and we work with that and those spells, that kind of magic, it's just as effective as something you would find like in a, a book made by somebody who came from a tradition with a long lineage. And the spell has been done thousands of times, you know, if it's personally relevant to you, then it is magical and it, it can be effective as well. So uh, after that, um, yeah, uh, Llewellyn asked me to write air magic and we did that and it took off. And then, you know, I always get this itch to write books. And uh, I was talking with Jason Menke about uh, writing the book that we had discussed the first time we ever met, you know, this, we had, we just felt like there was uh, never a good book about the Greek gods um, that was written from a pagan perspective by a pagan. Um, so we, you know, set out to do that. And um, now it's, it's, it's out starting today. And that's just such a wonderful thing. It's, um, it was such a dream to write that. So yeah, and also location wise, <laughs> I'm very close to Debbie here. And, um, you know, I'm in Southwest Ohio, uh, Dayton area, Yellow Springs. So um, yeah, it's, I've been here for a lot of my time, but I've also lived on, on the West coast and in Minnesota, Wisconsin, you know, Florida, uh, a couple other places just traveling for a while. Um, you know, when I was younger, but yeah, I'm settled down here in Southwest Ohio and, um, uh, yeah, I'm also an environmental scientist. Uh, I have my master's degree in environmental science and, uh, that's what I do for my job. And so that kind of flavors some of my writing and thinking as well. Well, that was definitely a mouthful. And yeah. it kind of gives a little bit more perspective because I think when it comes to witchcraft and magic, most people don't think science and it can coexist. So you having that type of background, that's one of the reasons why I love you because you take not only the spiritual side, but the scientific side and make it into one 
which, yeah. you know, when you did your air magic book, we've had you come out and I followed your journey with each book and I absolutely love it because the way that you write when you have your own books and you're not partnering is it's like almost like a trip with Hecate in a mm -hmm. way because you get that <laughs> journey mm -hmm. and you know even hearing about your own personal spiritual journey and you describing it what got you started with it like what was your moment of like this is what I want to do um well I I've always been attracted to a feminine deity energy and I just remember my mom, you know, she was looking at this church and we went to this church and I was in the, um, the, the big people's room, you know, <laughs> the, yeah, I can't, I don't know the church terms. Uh, we didn't go there for very long, <laughs> but, um, I just remember like everybody was singing about God as a, he, and I knew like deep inside of me that God could also be feminine uh, womanly, um, not necessarily like it had to be that one way, or it was only that one way. And, you know, maybe even like non-binary, it wasn't something that crossed my mind, but I just knew that, um, you know, for me, I wanted to be with the feminine deity. So, uh, I remember like everyone singing this like churchy song and singing, he shall blah, 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 or whatever. And I caught on really quickly that they were singing the word amen. And so I started singing all women as this little five-year-old kid <laughs> in the congregation, right? Um, the word came to me <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and I would look around at everyone else, like say, I would turn around in the back, look at the back behind me, the people and sing all woman as loud as I could. Like I wanted to invite them to, you know, observe that with me. Right. <laughs> my mom didn't stop me either. <laughs> That's like the best thing about this story. It wasn't me being a cheeky five-year-old. It was my mom like, okay, let's go <laughs> at the end of it all. Um, but she always just let me be who I was going to be, you know, and I'm lucky in that respect. I know a lot of people haven't had that upbringing or that kind of, those kind of options. They were, that's quite the opposite from what I hear mostly is people were punished for stepping right. out of line just a little bit. And so um, part of my practice is bringing that unconditional love and respect and holding space for people to explore, to be okay with whatever they're feeling and uh, to open up to that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Um, but then I knew that I was um, a pagan a little bit later when I learned how to read. And my mom had a really old uh, Edith Hamilton mythology book. Right. And so I was, uh, I remember, I just read everything I could. Once I started to read, I just read everything that was on the shelf. A lot of hippie books that she had. <laughs> I say those were my first witchcraft books, but they weren't really witchcraft books. It was mostly herbalism and stuff. But I just remember reading um, about um, these deities. And I was so moved. It was my first ecstatic experience. And that's how I knew that I loved these deities. And it, in particular, it was Artemis, which is really fitting because she's a protectress of young girls. Right. And I was a young girl. I was, I don't, I don't remember what age, you know, maybe eight or something. Um, but it was so moving that uh, I just knew that this is, this is what I was like, uh, this is who I am. Um, and I didn't know if anyone still observed the practice of the Greek gods. And what's really funny about that story is that um, I hear from a lot of people, their origin stories, how they came to the Greek gods. And a lot of right. people have similar stories. Like they were just moved to this point. Like they, they either like loved them so much and didn't know why they just had this affinity toward them or this ecstatic experience. And so I think it's, it's a really common thing that some of us forget about too. But, um, you know, when we look back into our childhoods and those first memories of interacting with them, even if it's just reading, you know, some of their myth. <laughs> right. And, you know, it's crazy find... when you look back at, you know, in a spiritual context, at least, you know, where you're at. And then you look back and you're like, Hey, this connects to there. And it kind of makes you go, okay, well, this has been around since I was, I can remember. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
I think that's the beautiful thing about it. And I think, you know, no matter what path you're on, whether you consider it witch or pagan or spiritualist, it gives you a sense of freedom that I think that people have lost in the church for a very long time. Mm -hmm. But there's also some good parts and hard parts with spirituality, which brings me into my next question. You know, for you, what do you feel like is the hardest and the easiest part of your spiritual journey? Um, well, I think um, there are blocks as to how far we can go. We can't just, you know, shoot up into the sky, you know, um, right. We have to learn patience with our magical spells and rituals and whatnot. I think that was, you know, that's something we all learn. Um, <clears throat> one thing that happened, another thing happened to me when I was somewhat younger, I think I was like 11 or something is I had an out of body experience and it was accidental, but it changed how I viewed everything in the world. Like I knew that um, I could exist without a body. I knew that there was more to everything than anyone was letting on pretty much, except for witches. <laughs> and um, I, I had another accidental out-of-body experience later in my early 20s. It was phenomenal. But, you know, what's really interesting is for the life of me, you know, I try quite often to do this again to astrally project and it doesn't always come that naturally i think it came like two more times probably or so <clears throat> um but uh, you know just it's it's not like a natural thing it's um you know these skills take time to develop they happen accidentally but um we can have breakthroughs with that kind of stuff but we're not in charge all the time of what happens to us and when and when things manifest and um when we actually get to do the things that we think we want to do so that's learning about that you know learning to have patience with the process learning to go into trance and um and all of that stuff is so important and you know i don't want to skip any steps but um, i also would love to have that experience again and be able to do that on purpose um, because that's a huge part of witchcraft i feel like that's that would um, nourish my life and then something tells me it's like yeah that might happen when you're older <laughs> and that's okay um so that, you, that's the hardest do you feel like when you were having those outer body experiences because i know a few people i've had conversations in private with that most of the time they've had that experience is when they're dealing with high amounts of stress Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like that was a connection at that time, just needing to escape this world for a little bit? That's an interesting question. I hadn't heard that theory. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the first time was when I was in um, seventh grade, junior high. So that's a very stressful time. <laughs> there were for a lot all. of bullies. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you, you know, I was, it was, it wasn't the easiest because I just felt like, well, I don't, what am I even doing here? <laughs> but, um, I was also stressed that night because I'd been trying to go to sleep and I couldn't. And so the frustration kind of, of insomnia. Yeah. yeah. And the second time was, um, in between a study abroad trip, I was like, I had just been immersed in Puerto Rico culture for like three whole months. And then I was home for two weeks and then going to Brazil, getting like all the shots, you know, for traveling abroad was uh, a bit much right. um, and stuff, you know, at the time, um, some of those, uh, anti-malarial drugs may actually make you hallucinate and stuff too, a little bit, or make you feel like you're seasick. Um, right. But I mean, I know this wasn't a hallucination. It was like, everything was like clear in the room. Like, you know, if you close your eyes, like you can like, oh, I can kind of like see the dresser over there, but you don't see every detail of what's on the dresser right. in your imagination. And in the astral world, you can see every detail. You're aware of everything. So I know I wasn't a dream. It, it wasn't a dream, but um, yeah, that was, those were very stressful times and I didn't really want to escape, but I needed a break probably, <laughs> if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. And, you know, maybe it's something in the future you can try and just kind of see where it is for you. And, you know, one of the things that since we are speaking of spirituality, spirits and our souls and that sense, one of the things that we talk about a lot on this channel, what many of our followers, followers found us for 
was actually Hecate. And I know you've worked with Hecate. How do you feel she came to you? Because everybody's story is different, but yet similar. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so what's interesting is that um, she's having a movement, kind of like Lilith right now is also having a huge movement. Uh, right. Especially uh, when you get into different shows such as Sabrina and all that. Yeah. And I think that they picked up on it. Um, I think it started a little bit before Sabrina probably too, but it's, it's exacerbating it. And I think it's a good thing, you know, because they have a lot of great things to teach us, but, um, yeah, uh, Hecate, um, a lot of my friends were into her and, um, I, uh, I'd never really felt called to take part in anything until I heard somebody tell me, um, about their experience with her. Um, and so it was intriguing to me and I approached her, you know, with reverence, <clears throat> um, a few years ago and, you know, I learned about her and, um, approached her in ritual, you know, just giving her some offerings and not asking for anything up front, <clears throat> but, um, it didn't, <laughs> what's really funny. Um, I, I may have shared this story. I can't remember, but this story, I have a specific story with her that I share in intuitive witchcraft and, the first time is, um, I had, um, I think it was <clears throat> a key. Like I had a key, you know, I was like, Oh, you know, here's a key for you. I'm just going to put this on my altar. Um, you know, this means like, you know, I respect you and I'm going to look at this key and think of you every time I see it. And it's just going to be our special little connection. You know, it's like building up the relationship a little bit. And, um, and then I heard in my head, you know, uh, as a sub, I don't know, I, the, the subconscious deity voice that comes through, I just heard paint it black. <laughs> and I was like, paint it black. Okay. I'll paint it black. And, um, so I didn't have any black paint, so I had to wait until the next time it was, you know, gonna, I was the next ritual and the next ritual, like two weeks later, it was a full moon or the new moon. It was, you know, I was going both of those and when I presented the black key and I was like, here you are, I painted it black for you. And then she was like, now find me an acorn. And I was like, okay, these are some barriers. These are some like gates she's putting up. Right. She's not really engaging me with me a lot yet, but she's just instructing me. She's kind of testing me. <laughs> she's seeing what I'll do. Like, how serious am I? How interested am I in working with her? Um, and so I found an acorn on a walk two weeks later, had the next moon ritual. And I'm like, here's your acorn. And she's like, paint that black too. <laughs> I was like, okay, um, this is a lot, but I'm going to do it. I'm like definitely committed. And, um, especially hearing that, you know, those right. instructions, if I didn't hear anything, I'd be like, oh, I guess, I don't know. But, um, it was, um, this little interaction, this testing interaction that I was like, okay, uh, I have, to, I have to make sure I deserve this. You know, she has to see that I'm into, um, working with her and that'll do what she says. So I did, I painted the acorn black and presented it. And ever since, and then there, when there was no more instruction then, <laughs> um, like, oh, finally, <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I just started calling upon her in ritual more and, you know, I check in with her and like, Hey, what do you think about this? You know? Um, and so, yeah, that's how it all started. But, you know, um, I think that she's a huge, um, icon for the times she's so like her energy is like gaining momentum right now. And, um, a lot of people find her because they need her and um she seeks them out which is really great so i have a story of seeking her out which is a, lo a lot different from other people like she comes to them she comes to those people who she wants to protect a lot of the marginalized people in our communities find themselves uh working with her because she insists upon it she's like hey we're gonna do this now i'm with you you're with me you're under my protection now and they're like, okay, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so when you were learning and from your experience with working with her, one of the things I like to ask those who do work with her is what advice would you give and what books do you find that is helpful when you were starting your journey? Because there's a lot of different information, as you know, 
a lot of different um, paths that can be worked with Hecate. There's the Trident path, there's the Greek path. Um, some say there's um, the Egyptian path as well with Akhet. Um, So for you, what worked for you? What advice would you give? Um, you know, everything that I do is a personal practice. And so I made it my own personal methods, um, basically calling upon her, um, asking for assistance, like hearing what she has to say, listening to her advice, um, you know, uh, figuring things out whenever I want change in particular, I petition her, but you're right. She does have a lot of different forms and functions within, uh, ancient Greek society and modern witchcraft as well. And so she could be, you know, someone who helps you like find the key to unlock some part of yourself or un unlock some magical stuff, uh, some manifestation. She could be the torchbearer who shows you the path that you have to travel upon. She could be, um, you know, the guardian at the gate who protects you from something or from, you know, outsiders or uh, any any damaging things and she has like so many epitaphs or names you know secondary names it's like amazing I love it right <laughs> it's ongoing so yeah I mean I think they're all right they're all accurate and like you said the spirit work as well she definitely uh, helps with that too as far as books I would highly recommend Courtney Weber's book Hecate Goddess of the Witches um, there's a Sarita Deste book as well I'm not sure what it's called um circle for Hecate Hecate I'm not yeah, sure I will also link these down in the description as well so yeah. if you guys are like I'm not gonna remember that just check down below yeah and then if you um you know uh want to have want to read more um Cindy Brannon has a few books as well if you um you know want to go down that path it's um really interesting how people have just branched off with these books and have you know, pretty different interpretations, but similar enough that, you know, you can find whichever interpretation you really need, I think. So one thing that wasn't in her questions, but kept on coming to mind as you were talking about Hecate and talking about the different things you were using is, and I've showed my husband this as well. I follow you on your social media mm -hmm. and I also follow your fire troop that you are a part of. And I've noticed a lot of spiritual combination with that, um, especially when you've got your headdresses on. There's been a few photos I've seen, which if you're okay with it, I can include in the podcast snippets. Of it, so you guys can check that out as well. Do you feel like when you're doing that, you sort of channel her in a way? Uh, one time I purposefully did. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, so, um, there was one time it was, um, just after a mass shooting that happened in my city and there was an event, um, the next weekend, I believe, or I can't remember if it was the next night or the next weekend, <clears throat> but, um, it was so soon thereafter and everyone was still heartbroken and kind of scared. And, um, I really wanted to call upon her as, um, her torch bringer aspect and light up people's fires or, you know, phosphoros right. aspect and bring the lights to people and help them find joy again, because, you know, there's a philosophy that I follow about the mass shootings is, you know, you can't control anything like that. And if you let that limit your life, then you're letting those kinds of, you know, terrorists win. And right. I don't want to follow that. I want to, you know, keep living my life as much as fully as possible. And so, um, I really wanted to bring that out, that energy out and support people and like help them feel seen and respected and just hold that space for them and the grieving that was happening as well. Um, but yeah, with the fire dancing, I do call upon, different deities at different times depending on the theme of the show and um what kind of energy we want to bring forth and my whole group we do this collectively um so uh you know not all the same deity but sometimes right 
I just wanted to bring it up because one, I love it. And two, I'm trying to get you guys to Witch in the Woods next year. So yes. I'm just throwing that out there. Right on. Yeah. Um, because you know, we're we are doing the Greek style, which is why I want you to come out to talk about the book as well. Yeah. Um, and since we are talking about styles, we're talking about reading and writing and everything in between. Um, Pathios, I believe is how it's pronounced. You started writing for many, many moons ago. How did that start for you? Why did you want to start writing and sharing your journey? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'd written two um, fiction books uh, by the time that I went to the Pagan Spirit Gathering led by Circle Circle Sanctuary um, again in I think 2017 it had been many years in between when I had gone and what's really funny um, it was it was kind of just like everyone just showed up there it was a really big festival it was great um, but I didn't know that there was a, a another witch bubble happening and uh, you know everyone was there it, it's just kind of like was happening so um, I happened to meet one of the presenters there his name was Jason Mankey his name is Jason Mankey um, and attended two of his workshops and then uh, a ritual. And then, you know, we were talking and, and I was like, oh yeah, I'm a writer. You're a writer. That's cool. And that's when we started talking about the Greek gods book. And then he was like, you should write for Pathios. And I was like, what's Pathios? <laughs> I, had no right. I had no idea people were blogging about stuff like this right now at the time, you know? Right. And so um, I'd had a few other blogs before about like, uh, creative writing and like a vegetarian food in the area, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, spreading the word, but, um, yeah, uh, I didn't, I was between projects and, uh, I was like, really you think people would want to like, know what I have to say. And he was like, oh yeah, yeah. You're basically doing what most people do. And, um, you have a great perspective and you're a writer. And so, um, <clears throat> he made that happen. And, and I'm really grateful for that because I just, I never would have known. I, I may never have gotten into writing were it not for him suggesting that. Um, so this whole experience with the book writing is almost like a full circle event for you. Yeah, that's it. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, you're right. Since, you know, that midsummer ish day in 2017. Yeah. <laughs> So for you, when you are writing, what inspires you? Is it just things from your life at the moment? You're like, I want to talk about this. Or is it based on what you're seeing in the culture or a little bit of both? Um, so blogs will be about the culture, a lot of reactionary posts, you know. Um, but when it comes to uh, books or long format stuff. I just, I have a lot of questions, you know, that just come up in my mind. And I wonder like, why is this like that? So why, what's all about this? What's the connection between this and that and that? And, um, right. I just, I love researching. I I've always loved reading. And so I just do this deep dive into books, websites, uh, uh, articles, um, journal, uh, things I don't, it's all kinds of things. I like, I ask people questions. And, um, so I just I start to like connect things like a little web. And before I know it, like there's a sense of momentum, like, Oh, wouldn't it be exciting if this happened or, Oh, what about right. this other tangential thing that, you know, you didn't think about yet. And, and so it just kind of like snowballs <laughs> And <laughs> before I know it, I'm just taking notes as fast as I can. And then my mind tells me things when I'm about to go to sleep I'm like okay good night time to go to sleep I don't sleep like that right <laughs> my arms cross over I don't know why I did that but like um it's uh my mind's like oh, what if the connection was you know that they're all underworld and chthonic and upper world at the same time you know so these little right. insights come through and and I have to like, wake up and like write it down <laughs> and um, like, you know, I love the fact that we're having this conversation because you don't like my husband's over here beside me going, yeah, yeah, because he's seen me do the same thing. And it's like most of your inspiration comes when, when you're having that calmness in the middle of the night and then you just start wondering and it kind of just goes from there. But yeah. 
Tell him I say hi. <laughs> Hello. So, you know, as we start to transition into actually talking about this lovely book right here, you know, we learned how you and Jason got together and where this idea cultivated so many moons ago, and now it's into fruition. Before I start asking you questions about it, how do you feel about it? It's got to be exciting. Yeah, it's so exciting. Um, it's uh, it's a dream come true, really, because we started talking about it again um, when COVID happened. You know, I was out of my air book, and I was, that was done. And I was like, "Oh, what's next for me? I don't, I don't really have anything in the pipe." And you know, we discussed it. He was currently writing another book at the time, and and yeah, it just came about like was like, okay, let's do it. Let's pitch it. And Llewellyn was like, we'll snatch it up. And <laughs> um, right now, just like looking at the final product, it feels really amazing because we put a lot of work into it. And there were times where I had to just put it down and walk away for a right. month and a half or so, because it was so overwhelming, especially writing about Demeter and um, Persephone and Hades, uh, getting all that history down was really important to me. And I obsessed over it and read and read, and I read so many books that I knit that aren't even in the bi bibliography and the bibliography is huge, you know, right? No, I can't use that. No, this other book says it, you know, but I really wanted to know as much about the Eleusinian mysteries as I could and present that in a way that people kind of could wrap their head around it. You know, I didn't want to say just like, oh, it's a mystery. That's <laughs> <all>. <laughs> oh, know? I love the fact that you say it like that because it does kind of feel like a mystery and we'll get later into that, but um, it's I, less I of a mystery now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, when we start out the book, you know, one of the things I was telling you before we actually started this podcast is I love the fact that we're, you know, even though it is called modern witchcraft, obviously, mm -hmm. we are taking a, a second to be like, look, if you've never dealt with the Greek, but you've heard the stories, there's a lot of difficulties with more moralities and shift changes and culture and like mm -hmm. trying to find that medium. Like, was that just something that you two wanted to put in or something that your publisher actually wanted you guys to put in that was a lot of um you know jason wants to talk about difficult subjects and you know shed some modern understanding about them and a lot of that was me as well um because there are difficult subjects to broach right there are difficult difficult interpretations they're you know bad myths there are bad parts of the culture, um, but we didn't want to gloss over any of that stuff necessarily. We didn't want to like, um, you know, just be like, everything's fine. Don't look behind the curtain. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, I, my, my astrology has a lot of like Plutonian and Scorpio stuff. So I'm okay swimming in those dark waters. And I know you know about right. that too. <laughs> but, Scorpio, <laughs> gotta love it. So yeah. Like I wanted to present it in a way that made sense and held space for people and didn't deny a problem, but also, you know, looked toward a more hopeful future and present and a more he healing nature of all of that content. And that was hard. Uh, you know, right. I had to um, use a lot of um, uh, poetic ideas and uh, phrasing and looking up of words and stuff like that, as you know. <laughs> right. It's, it, it makes it difficult. One of the things that I noticed that I didn't put in, but uh, as I mentioned, because I've done some like promo posts for this, been doing some hype over here on our channels and our podcast is, you know, you wanted not only just your guys's input, but you put in the input of others as well, mm -hmm. um, which shameless promotion, I'm in there. Hi guys. Yeah. Um, which was mm -hmm. awesome. But <laughs> for you guys, why was that important to have those personal aspects from those who followed. What did you find that was difficult? Because I know when I was going through some of the chapters, like for instance, Aries couldn't find nobody to work with them. Yep. When me and you had discussed, um, you're talking, you're having trouble finding those who work with Hades. So you want to talk about that for a little bit? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was really important for us to have passages from people who actually worked with those deities because we didn't have that personal relationship necessarily. Um, 
and really we were like, who wants to do this? What do you have? You know, we sorted through some of the stuff and the publisher rejected a couple of them. Um, the entries just because they were about deities that weren't really fitting in, uh, to the ancient Greeks. It was just, um, you know, a whole sorting of everything, but yeah, we couldn't find some deity, some deity, uh, devotees like, um, uh, Hades was one, Ares, Hephaestus, and um, we found a lot of people who love Hecate, <laughs> a lot of people who love Artemis, right, um, and Aphrodite, um, but yeah, and Zeus too, we couldn't find anyone who uh, worked with him necessarily, so um, we either had to write those passages ourselves um, or skip them, and in the case of Hades with you, I remember I was going, you know, you had an event, and I was going there and it was all set up, you know, we had talked about it beforehand and I had no idea you worked with Hades. And I, I remember like getting in the car, just being like, oh, I really want to find somebody who works with Hades. And then I get there <laughs> and that's one of the first things we start talking about. You start talking about him and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like right. This. That yes. day was one of the most interesting days. Cause I started my journey with him right before COVID. And like, it was one of those experiences where it's like, I need that mental energy to balance out because I've been with Hecate forever. And he's the one that came up and it shared in the book and all of that. So I'm not going to get into that because that's, that's for you guys to read. Um, but I do find it, one of the questions I did send to you, which I'm about to bring up is, you know, with Hecate, she's got such a following, so many references out there. But when you think of Hades, who deals with the same realm of things that she does in certain aspects, especially with spirituality, he gets painted in more of a darker way that is more towards the evil trope than she does. So, you know, that's why I kind of found it interesting that most people don't think to work with him as much. And I know most of that's probably because some of the rights have been lost. He wasn't really someone people invoked at that time um you know there is a site that you can go visit where his temple was which is mentioned in the book as well mm -hmm. but it just to me it just seemed odd like why do you think more people gravitate towards her than him is it just the lack of information or what's your opinion um well he was one of those figures people were afraid to say his name so they didn't really say hades a lot they said Pluton, uh, Pluton. Yeah. Um, so, uh, they were afraid of him, you know, they, right. I think it takes a scorpionic kind of person or Plutonian person to work with, um, Hades, you know, and, uh, it takes a lot of courage. Uh, you know, similarly, you don't see a lot of people working with the Norse goddess hell, you know, right. because she's the keeper of the underworld. Um, there's a certain amount of like um, discipline or punishment that could be happening in those places as, as well uh, as the culture believed. And um, so, you know, I think it, they, they become these scary people and they become associated with like uh, funerals and uh, grief and mourning. And not everyone wants to do shadow work. Not everyone wants to uh, encounter that energy or hold space for that energy within themselves. In fact, a lot of people that I know run away from that. So, um, and I, I think, you know, Hecate, when it comes down to it, she was more approachable. She had more favorable functions. She also helped people with magic and witchcraft. So, um, they, she was very appealing in that respect. She's like, I can take you from here to here, you know, right. Whereas he's like, we're just going to get deep. <laughs> and so, um, you know, uh, I think her offerings are a lot more enticing, uh, were enticing back then. And even today, um, because, you know, there were a lot of people who practiced, had magical practices back in ancient Greece too. And the book goes into a lot of those There are some, some of the uh, examples or some of the magical uh, suggestions are actually taken from some of those ancient magical practices that used, you know, a deity and some kind of right. ritualistic act or a spell. With that being said, since we, you know, we are talking about Hades in this sense, one of the things I found really interesting in the section talking about Poseidon 
was how Poseidon and Zeus at one point in time were seen as the same being. And I've seen the theory go around of how Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus were all one, but got split, you know, throughout time. And do you think that still holds true in some aspects for you, you know, knowing Greek mythology, writing this book, it was there things that you wanted to put in that you weren't able to? That's a good question. Um, well, we know that, um, you know, the funerary rites with Hades associated with Hades go back, uh, into ancient times before there was written history. We do know, um, that, uh, Poseidon's adherence, or at least historians believe that Poseidon's adherence arrived with Demeter in, uh, you know, what's now mainly in Greece, uh, Athens area at a certain time, and then Zeus's ad adherence arrived later. And it is possible um, that these three deities may have at one time been similar, but, you know, what we don't see is Hades associated with um, anything but the underworld. But um, curiously, a lot of Greek uh, text, ancient Greek texts, combine them and they actually combine like Zeus and Hades. And they um, also, you know, say that there's the three deities ruling the three worlds. There's Zeus with the sky, Poseidon with the water, and then Hades uh, below ground that, you know, they ignore kind of like the mid ground, uh, which is, you know, probably Gaia's domain, uh, right. the great mother's domain. <laughs> um, Zeus is like inferred to be ruling over that, but um, yeah, so the three brothers are also kind of like combined uh, in that respect um, as that, in a way, like a triple male deity of, uh, and it's it's interesting the way that they reference it too. They do it in a very specific way to kind of indicate that they have this power, um, they were given these these powers over the world, so um, there's some uh, good ideas about those being similar or the same, but it's hard to kind of know when history just kind of like there's like a a, a record scratch at some right. point. Like what happened? Like we can guess. We we have certain things that are already in place and certain things that were changed, and the myths and the uh, stories just kept evolving too. So they rewrote a lot of history. They rewrote a lot of the myths. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about things like that. So when it comes to the myths, you know, like there's so many different myths, especially when it comes to Persephone, especially when you get into um, one of the newest things that is out where they're redoing Olympian mythology with cartoons and all that. Do you think that there's this romanticized version of Persephone and Hades that most people are flocking to versus the other? And how do you feel like it's changing the perception of those mythos in a modern context? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, I love your questions, by the way. <laughs> They're so well thought out. Um, so well, yeah, we're seeing another retelling of the story, right? So um, we have the original ancient Greek stories of Homer and Hesiod, the ones that they told, and then it evolved from there. You know, um, Ovid rewrote a lot of stories. He's a Roman poet, uh, uh, and a lot he made a lot of them more misogynistic and cruel. Um, and you know, I don't think that that his stories are really. Uh, Greek in nature. I think those are more Roman, but then we, you know, see the evolution through um, the medieval ages and the Renaissance of the, the gods are still there. And then um, through the enlightenment and through the founding of countries, the, you know, the deities have, are, are like the patron of the country, you know, right. <laughs> you see Athena, a woman looking, a, a goddess looking like Athena in, um, you know, Great Britain's um, uh, whatever patron deity, I guess. Uh, so, and you keep seeing this repeated and now we're in the modern culture and the stories are being retold again with our modern culture and in the form of cartoons, as you said, and, um, yeah, they are ever changing. These myths are ever changing, ever evolving. What I find a lot of inspiration is in, is looking back at what we knew about them, 
uh, culturally as well as mythically at the time. So there was a big deep dive into Persephone and you know what the myths actually meant compared to the culture. What's really funny is um, the myth of Persephone was romanticized a lot in Italy. It was like there was a whole temple to her there and her husband. But um, there were like these um, wall carvings of her picking out her wedding items and putting them in a, a little trunk. And um, there are statues of her sitting next to Hades and they're just like beaming. They've got right. all their uh, correspondences. like, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and it was kind of that temple, it's theorized that that was used to help women prepare for marriage. And in Greece, we don't see that quite as much. So we have differing, and you know, at the time that was a part of uh, broader Greece, not mainland Greece, you know, but right. a Greek world area, Greek colony. Uh, so, you know, we see different interpretations even back then. And, um, you know, some people say that however you want to interpret it, or you need to interpret it, or however they tell you it is, is valid for you it may not be valid for somebody else, but, um, it's, you know, we all have lessons to learn from the gods and they're, here to help us and teach us. So there are many different ways you can look at these stories. And um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think, you know, looking at all of the stories is what helps me the most and then choosing what's relevant to me. I love that. You know, one of the things that I really liked about the book too, is how you deep dive into Hestia. Um, I have a couple of friends who work with her and they're like, there's not really a whole lot about how to work with her. And one of the things that I found interesting before I even got your book, before I even read it, and before, you know, I've, I always honor Hestia, but I never really deep dive into Hestia. Mm -hmm. And this year I was thinking about next year for Witch in the Woods and I want to make, you know, I've highlighted the Norse and other different cultures as far as spirituality goes, but I've never really done it in more of a Greek style and then with this book coming out um you know we were talking about you know doing a torch lighting ceremony and then when I read in your book I'm like you know it, I had done my research as well prior and I love the fact that it was mentioned because it's not something that people think of to look at um as far as like how it was done what's the reason behind it um when you were writing about this both of you um mm -hmm when it comes to the tradition of lighting those torches, lighting that flame of Hestia for the gods and for herself, do you feel like that's something that should come back as far as in ritualistic practices? Or should we just stay more in a modern context? We got modern ways of doing things, in your opinion. Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, so it's really easy to um, use that in modern context. You can see I lit a candle right here for her <laughs> before we went live. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, just telling her this is for you. You know, you helped me carry this sacred fire and you helped me start this whole thing. So thank you so much, Hestia, for being a part of this. And, you know, lighting a candle is super easy. We can't always do it in every situation, you know, but um, even like the LED candles, people are using those to represent the, the flame for her because it's still energy being used. It's still light being emitted. I think it's still valid too, but right. it's interesting. Like you said, um, <clears throat> uh, she was part of the processions, uh, and the torches. And, uh, that's like so moving for all of us, you know, but she was also part of when, when a ritual was taking place, like at the, uh, actual culmination center, or if there wasn't a procession, there usually was a procession, but, um, at the uh, actual culmination center, uh, Hestia would be the first deity invoked there, and um, they would make a fire there. Uh, a lot of times it was because they were going to have some kind of a sacrifice, and that was a way to cook the meat. And not everyone ate meat all the time there, but, um, you know, kind of like warming up the oven. <laughs> Right. <laughs> having a procession into my kitchen, let's warm up the oven. I'm going to, you know, make this sacrifice or, you know, with these chicken cutlets or whatever. <laughs> and, um, 
uh, yeah, uh, release some of that energy into the world for the gods. And then, you know, while the food was cooking, they would have the ritual. And then after the ritual was done, the food would be f- fully cooked, ready to eat. And um, so after everyone left, they would burn the bones. And so that's why she was the first and the last. Like she um, took care of all the the trash that was left behind, whatever, you know, napkins or bones that were left over the, the hide and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, um, like we don't necessarily, a lot of us probably don't sacrifice animals and it's, you know, probably illegal unless you have a farm right. or something. <laughs> Uh, and I don't encourage it necessarily. I don't think it's necessary, but, um, yeah, the simple act of lighting a candle, uh, and then calling upon her to being the first thing you do. And then the last thing you do is blow out the candle. That's simple enough, you know, um, and you know, anything you want to do in between there as part of your ritual or a magical practice, I think it will be blessed by her presence. So here's another question for you do you think that you guys are going to pair up and do you know a continuation of you know how to work with the greek gods is that something you guys have talked about since everything's in motion or you just kind of just wait and see how this goes well um jason and i are both both very verbose (laughs) like we (laughs) easily fill pages and pages and pages and like we we like to be very thorough too so i think we did a pretty good job with um that kind of a question um but the one thing that someone has suggested to us that we laughed about immediately and started to consider I, i don't know but like doing a book about like the norse pantheon the norse gods or you know a different set of gods and we would have to get passage authors obviously because i don't work with all of them but right you know something like that um is definitely within the realm of possibility but um yeah i think that we're waiting to see how this goes over and you know obviously we would have to do it justice we, it would have to be another big huge research project to make sure that we present the information accurately and sincerely and respectfully um so yeah and we've taken part in some norse rituals too uh you know, fortunately <laughs> these festivals are so good at having like uh you know rituals and interactions where we can do this kind of stuff so um but yeah we've talked about that but um i think this is our our first and last greek book together <laughs> for you do you feel like maybe in the future it might be something that you personally do or do you feel like everything that you've wanted to say was already been said i want to make other connections with some greek deities and some other deities and some beliefs and practices so I think I said everything I wanted to say in there, in that format, it was, it was really great because, you know, there's a history, there's a magical practices, and there's a devotee section for most of the, most of all of the major gods, right. And right. a lot of the side ones as well. Um, but yeah. Um, so I think that we, like, we covered all the bases with that, but yeah, I I'm interested in exploring a lot of other realms of possibility. I'm also, I promised myself I'd take about a year off after writing my last book because right. it's been very intense lately and I love it you know this is such an honor to do this work and to share it and to have an audience for it and people are learning stuff and you know they want to keep learning more about it and I just want to keep sharing more I want to do this more and more but I do have a day job too so uh yeah it's my goal to you know actually get out and meet people and talk to people now that COVID is somewhat letting up and stuff and um, you know, it's, it's one of those things, like I want to have fun and, uh, more experiences too, you know? So yeah. Freedom among the chaos. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it seems like, you know, you're hard at work. Cause I mean, as I was deep diving and, you know, I wanted to talk about you. I wanted to talk about the book cause we've never really introduced you. So I'm like, what else can I learn that I do not know? Um, and one of the things that I learned while I was on a live and I was, you know, sharing about you and sending people your way is that you have another book coming out in 2023 yeah. talking about crafts and magic, which I love. Can you give us kind of like a little snippet of that? Yeah. Um, thank you for bringing it up. Uh, so it's called inspiring creativity through magic, and it's all about creating a ritual 
to bring about the inspiration for you to do any kind of like artsy, crafty magic. Um, you know, whether you're a writer like I am, fire dancer, um, if you're a potter, if you um, just write poetry, if you um, are a dancer, if you, um, any, any kind of arts, like uh, if you're, if you do knitting, even it's anything you want to do. I found that the more you can make a ritual and create the the better your things will be like the the quality of your work will just be like that much more enriched with the spiritual experience and it's super easy so I suggest you know um, there's a lot of different suggestions but it, there's also working with the creative spirit who is said to give inspiration and one thing that witchcraft is great at is uh, this practice this teaching that we can work with spirits. They're not always going to be bad. We can use our discernment to know if they're going to be bad and banish the ones that are bad, of course. But the ones that are helpful, you know, like the muse spirits, they gave inspiration. I love the fact, not to interrupt you, I mm -hmm. love the fact that you said that because my next question was going to be about muses. Yeah. Because I kept hearing muses, muses. And I'm like, what if she doesn't talk about it? That's going to be mm -hmm. awkward. And then you say it, go for it. Just wanted to put that in there. <laughs> Yeah. And you know, Stephen King says he has a muse. It's a little dog spirit. Um, right. he talks about it, you know, and a lot of people work with these creative spirits. Tori Amos works with the muses, um, both when she creates her songs and when she performs them. So I wanted, I work with one too. Like I was writing a novel one time and I just I was so engrossed in it. And I noticed there was this little spirit and I was like, what is that? And it kept disappearing. Mm -hmm. and I would get off track with my novel <laughs> and um but then eventually I was like okay I'm gonna hunt it down figure it out what it is like for, first of all it's like how do I get in my house like I have protection right. <laughs> but um yeah it was a muse spirit and it's been helping me ever since and uh I have to learn how to let it come and doing the ritualistic approach to creativity is what helps so much because the inspiration just flows into my head. It like trickles like water running down a cool water and it feels amazing. And I've noticed that I produce some of my best works when that's happening and the words just come a lot easier. They're better words. It's all me, but it's also the inspiration. It's like me squared in a way or me enhanced <laughs> right enhanced yes yeah, so um yeah and it's all about that and also about performance skills as well because being a fire dancer I know how to put on a good show you have to yes you do I hope to see it one day I really do we'll make I've seen the video and I'm like oh like it's it's one of those things like you know we try our best as witches to put creativity whether it's our food it's our dance it's our music there's a lot of things within spirituality you can introduce in all aspects of your life and when i get to see creative artists within the community who are not just one thing but multi-dimensional mm -hmm. and you see it blossom i love seeing that that's why i will always support you and i appreciate you being here and talking about your book letting me be a part of your experience and share it with those that I can. With that being said, I know that you're doing a giveaway. So you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, Llewellyn is hosting a giant giveaway and I'm, it's so special. I couldn't even believe it when they said it, <laughs> it's um, going to be phenomenal. It is going to be all of my Llewellyn books and all of Jason's Llewellyn books and modern witchcraft with the Greek gods. So I think that's, I mean, like that's going to be three books for me that, and I think Jason's written like nine or something. So, right. When I looked at his like bio, cause I felt like I was excluding him without trying to exclude him. So I'm going to have to reach out to him or you can send him my way and I can yeah. give him his due respect. But like, as I was going through his stuff and even reading in the book, his personality comes through so well, it's almost like, I'm not trying to be mean but I'm trying to give you the right information from my personal experience. And I love that about him, but go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's very accurate about things. And like, that's why it was so great to work with him on it. We, we have different tones. Like I come across as more poetic and scientific and he's very casual. So, you know, but uh, you know, the biggest concern I had was blending our 
different styles, but, you know, I became a little bit more conversational. I think he became a little bit more poetic and right. people have said that the combination is a good thing. So yeah, this giveaway is going to have all of our books from Llewellyn. So it's a really special giveaway. And, um, it's, I think it's happening, you know, the day of our release, December 8th. So yeah. So do you know how people can enter for that? Um, or yeah. will you just send me information? I can link it down below as well. Llewellyn will have um, some kind of a giveaway post. So look at uh, on Instagram, I believe on Instagram, maybe Facebook too. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, check that out. So is there anything else that you would like to plug different websites, different ways people can communicate with you? Um, any events that they may see you at next year? So yeah. that way they oh can gosh. meet the, one of the brilliant authors behind the book. <laughs> yeah. So the events next year are going to be amazing. I really want to talk to you more about Witch in the Woods. So we'll continue that via email and hopefully I'm not booked up. <laughs> that I time. hope not. <laughs> um, I know I'm going to do the Witch City Tarot Gathering. I'm going to be the keynote speaker there in Salem, Massachusetts at the Haunted Hawthorne Hotel. That's got to be so exciting. I'm so thrilled. And that's in uh, mid-July, I believe. And uh, it's going to be a very special very special event. It's like, we're putting together so much. It's so exciting. And then, uh, I'll be at Starwood. Jason will be there too. We're going to do some stuff there. We're not sure exactly what yet. Um, oh, I'm going to be at Paganicon in March in Minnesota. That just came through. So that's good. Uh, not sure I'm going to do it there yet either, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we do have some witch lab events going on December 8th, 9th and 10th. Yeah. I had seen that. If you want to talk about that as well, cause I think that's local, right? Yeah, that's Columbus. So, um, I know I've met a lot of your, uh, listeners, viewers. Um, so yeah, we'd love to see you up there in Columbus. We're not traveling anywhere for further South, unfortunately. Right. Um, but yeah, we're having like a book signing on December 8th, Thursday, December 8th. And then um, we're having a, a little Saturnalia Greco-Roman ritual afterward. And um, we're also having like a very informal discussion uh, that day. We have some workshops the next couple of days too. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are either Greek or, you know, some of our other ones that we've done in the past that are really empowering and important and good. I'm doing an air magic workshop, um, on Saturday, I believe it's the 11th. Um, I think it, no, it's at 11 AM. I think it's the 10th <laughs> and, uh, we're going to go into all of the correspondences of air and some air magic hacks. And then there's going to, it's going to end with like a very empowering ritual for everyone to really embody the powers of air and have that ability to pivot, um, have that ability to, you know, have discernment, you know, whatever they really need, we're going to help boost that within them. I love that. Hopefully I can have you back on because I would love to deep dive into your other books as well, because I've read them. I love them. And, you know, so does many in the people in the community, because, you know, you have been one of the many voices. People don't realize how many pagan authors are in Ohio until they start looking. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for joining us. For anybody out there, go check out the book. It should be out today. You can get it on Amazon. I'll also link uh, private links as well and any of the information. With that being said, guys, always remember, no two witches, witch alike. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the podcast. I know that I had fun making it, and I appreciate that Estrella Taylor joined us to promote her new book, Modern Witchcraft with the Greek Gods. You can find it anywhere where books are sold. You can even get a signed copy through Estrella's website as well. And remember, we are doing a giveaway. So comment down below. Let us know what you thought, how you feel. How did you meet some of the Greek gods that you work with today? And with that being said, maybe if you like the content here, you want to become a Patreon supporter to help us keep doing what we're doing, not only online, but within our local community here in Ohio. And with that being said, I hope that all of you enjoy this new book like I did. I found a lot of great information in it, and I enjoyed it as well. And I will be doing a review on it from my own personal experience and sharing it with you to my own personal thoughts when it comes to this book. So it's out for release now. What are you waiting for? Go grab your book today.